You know that? Get in here! Or I'm gonna give you a world of hurt, little man! You know that? Intoxicated Master, where we talk about the culture, pop culture, politics, and anything else that comes up. Joining me as always is Brandon. Hey, hello, my people. Jim. Hello, everyone. And Kale is sort of with us. He will be popping in, presumably, any minute now. Um, Almost so today, popping in, popping out. Yes, very much popping in, popping out. We'll, we will get, we will get literally several words out of him, uh, but uh, they will be wise words. Um, today. Uh, maybe a bit overdue on a ch channel called intoxicated masculinity we're going to be talking about masculinity um it's kind of a big topic and we're definitely not going to cover even close to all of it on this video uh but before we talk about masculinity let's talk about intoxication brandon what are you having tonight i'm just having some plain old rye rye plain whiskey rye. which kind is it it's the rabbit one. Oh, gotcha rabbit hole jim what are you having uh i'm having a simply spiked Lemonade. Does it taste simple? It's pretty simple. Does it taste simple? Since we we're talking masculinity, I almost went in for some wine, but I didn't want to open a brand new bottle for it. So we'll ask Kale what he's drinking when he gets back in. Um, so uh, this video is probably going to be split off into two videos. I'm not sure exactly where uh, we'll split it up, but we will. Uh, so I am starting off uh, with a lovely pink cocktail uh, called a Cosmopolitan, which we've done on this channel before. Um, and I think it's sort of interesting because cocktail choice does matter. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about how all these different things sort of are a part of masculinity and, and a part of whether it's toxic masculinity or, or, or all these other things. Um, but uh, yeah, I think most guys are afraid to order cocktails like that at the bar. Um, and That's you shouldn't because uh... Cosmopolitan is a great cocktail. Um, and after that, when we go to our second episode, I'm going to drink some nice Maker's Mark uh, barrel strength bourbon. Because here's the thing, you can enjoy barrel strength bourbon and you can enjoy cosmopolitans and you can enjoy wine, you can enjoy water, you can enjoy anything. Your cocktail choice should not be a representation of your uh, gender. And it's just that simple. And if you think it is, that's very clearly a societal construction. Yeah, so I think that's the first thing we should talk about, because this is the thing that I think gets people genuinely confused, and that is uh, sex and gender. Um, so uh, in very simple terms, uh, sex is physiological. Sex is when you're born, you have certain external physical characteristics. That is sex. Um, gender is significantly more complicated. Gender is in your mind. Gender is in society. Gender is a construct, as people are, are want to say, and they are, are correct in saying. So um, what we are talking about here is gender, uh, masculinity, gender masculinity, not sexual mass, not masculinity as a sex, masculinity as a gender. Um, and so I said this kind of at the beginning, and I want to reiterate this. There is, and you know, we, we looked through a lot of stuff, watched a lot of videos, and did a lot of research on this. Um, we are not going to cover one one hundredth of what this topic really deserves. Um, so what I kind of decided we would do is this is going to be kind of our intro. This is all of our intro. This is the first time we've all talked about this topic together. Um, so we're going to hit a, we're going to hit several different areas. Um, and we're going to just kind of get our thoughts out there. And then later on down the line, we're going to get into more specific topics because, you know, we're going to, uh, you know, talk about um, identity, uh, consumerism, um, performativity, um, and all these types of things. And we are not going to be able to cover all these topics. Um, but I think to start off with, uh, Brandon, what did, you, what did you sort of run across most when you were researching this? Well, I mean, it's not a huge surprise that I'm a leftist. So I mostly followed videos from a leftist orientation. Um, but a lot of it is, from, at least on a leftist side, is introduction to the concept. Like nobody's really um, debating the concept. Most of the videos we watched on the leftist side was introducing the concept and how some people are getting it wrong, at least as far as toxic masculinity goes. Um, and they do a really good job of showing how um, some of our behaviors that we just naturally identify as masculine is a social construct and doesn't follow anything in the real world outside of uh, tradition and culture, which are real 
things in that they are concepts and things you can point to, but it would definitely be, it, it would be weird to say, okay, men always, you know, have cowboy boots and drink whiskey when in Japan, traditionally men would wear, you know, what we would consider more feminine clothing and would drink sake. I mean, it would just, or, or water and not drink at all. You know, a lot of these things are things that, you know, we inherit from TV shows and music and, and that's where the performative side of it comes in. You know, we see John Wayne walking a certain way. You know, we see uh, people in movies, like the one of the videos was the impossible white man trope in, in movies. They walk around with the big guns, you know, and they get the job done and they're never afraid of anything. And, and you see this, but it's all a story we tell ourselves and doesn't actually, it, it's map that does not reflect the territory. Yeah, it's, I, th I think it, it's an identity. And I think that's the, you know, the one thing that I started to get, to get confused, and I'm going to go to Jim here in just one second, but um, is, you know, there is such, for lack of a better term, identitarianism in this country where everybody's identity is so incredibly important um, and their identity is so complicated and masculinity is sort of one of those and we have to do things that reinforce that identity. I don't know, Jim, what, what, have you, what did you come across sort of in your initial, uh, initially looking at this? Um, so I feel like for me, it's really helpful to keep sex and gender in mind. It's kind of dovetailing off of what Brandon was saying. Um, the things that we think of as masculine are gender constructs. They're not inevitable um, aspects that we inherit from our genetic code, from our sex. Um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> not surprisingly, because it's a concept that's uh, more adopted uh, in leftist conversation um, because we live in a zero sum game right now with everything. Uh, there seem to be people that think it's a bad term and it it's tearing men down. Um, but uh, I think it's just like, <clears throat> it's like any sort of personal characteristic. Some of the characteristics can be good in certain situ situations, but if you take them too far, they're, they're bad. Like you can be organized or you can be uh, completely over at the top, drive everybody crazy because you can't handle change. And I feel like, you know, some of the masculine traits um, that were, you know, discussed in some of the, the video links, um, some of them are not really necessarily negative traits, um, uh, but some of them are if you take them too far. Like being assertive isn't necessarily uh, a negative trait, but if you take it too far and you're aggressive, then it is. Well, yeah, and there's also the, the sum being more than its parts. When you put traits that can go negative and start clustering them all together, then it gets worse. Right. Well, you sort of mentioned uh, uh, assertiveness. So I think that you could sort of see that on a spectrum of assertive versus aggressive. And, you know, it is, it is good to be assertive because unfortunately the way things are in this world, you really do have to stand up for yourself. And oftentimes if you don't, no one else will. Um, so whether it's in your job or in your personal life, um, asserting your value as a person and asserting the things that you need, uh, you know, to sort of live your life, that's important. Um, but then going and using aggressiveness to threaten people or to intimidate people is obviously a totally different bag. So I think a lot of those traits, you know, a lot of the traditional masculine traits, which we can talk a little bit about, um, are good. Uh, leadership, for example, um, demonstrating leadership is good because if, you know, especially if you're in a situation, I think if all of us have done group work, uh, whether it be academically or in the workplace or wherever, and oftentimes there needs to be one person to step in and kind of say, okay, you should probably do this because you have a, you know, you have a talent for doing this and you should do this because you have a talent for doing that. And that kind of ability to show leadership is a good thing. Um, but on the sort of, just like with assertiveness and aggressiveness, um, 
on the opposite side of leadership is being control freak and telling everybody what they have to do all the time. And that's obviously an incredibly negative trait. Um, and so all these traits is, or, or independence is another good example. Sorry, I'm looking at some of these off the, this webpage. Independence, being an independent person, being able to function independently is important. Uh, but being uh, self-isolating is an incredibly sort of self-harming trait. So I think it's important to look at all these sort of traditionally masculine traits and think, you know, are these good things? Are these bad things? And Kale has come back to us. So real quickly, Kale, what, what are you having tonight? He's a rebel. Big, big bottle of rebel. I didn't even know they made big bottles. Um, so, uh, yeah, so some of those traits, uh, uh, Brandon, so I missed a couple of these. You kind of were looking, what, what do you think about that? The idea of these traits being sort of being two-sided in some ways. Yeah, I mean, mm. you know, they, you have the phrase, they turn it up to 11. Obviously having the volume down at zero isn't helpful to anybody. So some traits are worthwhile. Like you're saying about assertiveness, we could probably argue about leadership. Um, but some traits are probably worth having. It's when you combine them all and then turn them all up to 11, which is naturally going to happen because you're always going to have people competing with each other. You know, especially in a world where there's uh, social media to where you can look at somebody's page and see them post a pic of the new car or motorcycle they got or whatever and all the reactions they got. It's natural to say, oh, well, I bet I can top that and do whatever. And this also translates into uh, action heroes. I mean, the next time you see a action like a part two has to be over the top over a part one um books are the same way uh, even just people at work you'll often find these people where no matter what story you have they've done something like it only better you know turned it up plus one so a lot of the times even these positive or neutral traits when combined and then competed against just get turned up to 11 and become toxic well, so that's another thing that I came across that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find my notes on this. Um, and uh, shopping habits. One thing I was kind of interested because in, because I believe that that mass the masculinity as it is put out to us because it's not that's one of the things you know when we say it's a social construct it is, uh, but we sort of we say that in sort of a passive voice, um, and I think that's that can be a mistake. It is also constructed, um, and. And oftentimes, I think, especially in the United States, it's constructed by people who have a, an interest in something. Um, so in the case of sort of the, the way our country is now, we are, we are a very consumerist country. Our country is run primarily by politicians who are, uh, let's just soft pedal and say influenced by corporations. Some might say wholly owned uh, by corporations. And so whether it's our media or our politicians, all of our thought leaders have sort of this interest in pushing a consumerist message. So uh, masculinity has a tendency to have adapted this sort of consumerist identity. Um, and so I was looking online and there's a really interesting statistic where in the last, and I, I don't remember the number of years, I have to look at the study and it's gonna be linked in our, in our uh, description below. Uh, but men have recently uh, been shopping consistently more than women. Uh, whether it be on Amazon or even in retail stores, you know, so you sort of there's sort of this this previous idea of women are the ones who go shopping and men, you know, stay behind and put nails in boards all day. Um, but it's not the case anymore. Uh, uh, men are shopping just as much as women are, in many cases, more often uh, because we've had this constructed masculinity, uh, and now part of that is you have to 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 uh, um, demonstrate your masculinity. You have to own certain products. Um, you have to have a gun and you have to have a truck and you have to have uh, a certain type of clothes and you have to have, you know, you have to be watching a certain type of media. And so it, it, it just, it dovetails together where all of a sudden you realize that the, our thought leaders are telling us one thing and, but then just, just saying in the passive voice that, oh, these people are destroying your masculinity, but then in a backhanded way are saying, by the way, your masculinity is buying our products. Uh, yeah. And I think that's 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 very damaging. It's it's damaging 
to people because now all of a sudden, um, well, what if I what if I can't afford a brand new truck? Well, then I'm not masculine enough because I'm not going to buy, you know, a seventy thousand dollar Ford F one fifty. I'm going to have you know a five year old Ford F one fifty. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think about that sort of that sort of uh, connection between consumerism and masculinity? I think it's demonstrable even just in my lifetime. It, back in the early '90s when I was in high school, at least my impression in the small town I grew up with, if you came to school in a pickup truck, people would laugh at you. They'd have considered you, you know, some rube from down on the farm or something. They'd they'd think it was funny that you bothered. Now it's a status symbol. I mean, it's changed in just those, what, 30 odd years. Um, Kale, you know a lot of people that are kind of more to the right of us. What do you, what do you see about their purchasing habits and the sort of the idea of the things they buy being a part of their, of their sense of masculinity? Well, I'm glad you bring it up because that was one of the talking points I jotted down uh, as far as advertising goes. It's always uh, lean, lent, lent lent toward uh masculine purchasers uh for the most part i mean there are obviously uh products that are geared more toward the uh feminine but a lot of it most of it is about you know proving your your manliness your virility and you need to buy this big truck and you need to do this thing and go to man of war camps and uh, you know, be like this leader, this tough guy that takes charge of everything. And like, as far as the truck thing goes, like, like Brandon said, when uh, back in the, you know, late eighties, early nineties, it was kind of a, Oh, you drive a truck. Well, you must be from the farm or something. And now it's a status symbol, but now a truck isn't really even a truck anymore. Like my dad has been a truck guy for a while, but I mean, he just has like a regular pick them up truck you know just one that you buy and that's what it is he doesn't take it to some place and have it jacked up and big stupid wheels and uh you know or get like a diesel and have it tuned so you can roll coal because you know burning excess fuel is you know wasteful and cool and just like you're you're becoming the advertisement you're carrying on what the company is trying to push you're becoming the pusher of it. Yeah, I, I think because uh, I, I do think that there, I mean, I think trucks have always been kind of a little masculine, but it was also like just you have a truck, but now it's like, well, what truck do you have and how high is it and how big is the engine? And like, um, I mean, the thing that I first noticed when I, when I started, because I, I owned a truck for a little while, uh, it was a, a, a 1999 Ford F-150 that had more rust than it did paint. Um, and uh, I started noticing people getting these trucks with these incredibly short boxes on them um, where it's like a four foot box and it's like got the, it's jacked up and it's got like, you know, the super duper extended cab. And I'm like, you've essentially got an SUV with a, with a, uh, a cart on the back of it. Like that's not even really a truck. Um, and, really big... and then if you want to haul anything, you have to put a stupid drop down hitch that's three feet long to get back down to the trailer you're trying to hook up to. There was actually a video I saw of somebody, the truck, truck was jacked up so high that it had a, a runner that would come down. Um, and the, the, it was a lady, not a guy driving it, but she had to like bounce on a trampoline to get to the lower runner so she could then get to the regular runner so she th could then climb into the truck. And it's just like, that's a clown car. I mean, let's just, let's just call it as that's a clown car. There are laws though that, uh, I don't know if they've, they've changed in, and I'm sure it varies by state. But I know like when I was a little kid, uh, my uncle uh, had a Jeep that he had jacked up and the local cop said it can't drive it on the road because the bumper is too high. And Brandon's dad even had like a giant truck that I'm pretty sure the bumper was like right at the legal limit for the state at the time. It, that thing was gigantic. It sucked down the gas. I mean, I know. Did not handle ice very well, though. I remember it got stuck in one spot in a driveway. It just, I was like this great big muscle bound truck and it couldn't freaking move because a little bit of ice was underneath it. Meanwhile, my dad's <laughs> little Ford Fiesta could just go on anything because it weighed like six ounces. <laughs> 
but I had a, I had a little S10, and I'll be honest, it was one of the funnest vehicles I ever had. I mean, I could romp around in a little bit. It was the ZR1 or whatever the hell they call it with the skid plates underneath it and the oversized tires. But I mean, it was it was just a little pickup truck. I wasn't trying to impress anybody. I was just having fun. And like the the vehicle I drive now, the the little SUV that I drive, my stepdaughter lovingly calls it my bitch mobile. So I'm not that worried about it, I guess. Well, and you know, it's um, way back. I think it was in the '90s. Uh, Naomi Klein wrote a book called No Logo, and it talks a lot about. Well, I, I'm going to use an example that I think is outside that book, but um, uh, the one in the mall, Hot Topic, how Hot Topic essentially commodified an entire subgroup's style and then sold it back to them in malls. And I think that's one of the things that kind of fuels the toxic masculinity. Again, it's all competition and consumerism you know if you buy this size of truck and suddenly you've got 10 man points then if i buy the bigger size up then i've got 11 man points i win you know by the way uh, that point was illustrated very well in the uh, eminent scholar mc lars in his song Hot Topic is not punk rock. Hot Topic uses contrived identification with you subcultures to manufacture an anti-authoritarian identity and make millions. Uh, Jim, I feel like we've sort of talked over you a little bit. What, what do you think about all this stuff? So sort of the consumer of nature, consumerative nature of, of masculinity today. Um, well, I think like a lot of things, if it helps sales, then we will do it. It doesn't matter whether it's good for people or bad for people. If it helps the bottom line, then that's, uh, that's what corporations do because you know since uh uh i can't remember his name but the ge guy in the 80s really kind of accelerated corporate culture being that being the number one goal was uh increasing shareholder value and um fiduciary value, the fiduciary responsibility um and i mean what a great way to sell product I mean, do you really need a truck? You don't, you don't need a lot of this stuff. But if you feel like that's, that masculinity is really important and your identity of masculinity is portrayed through the stuff you have, then you probably do think you need it. But well, it's not a, it's not a, a you know, a, a luxury buy. It's something you need to have. Along that same lines, Jim, I have known people that live in cities who buy like cow catchers for their truck. They've probably never even seen a cow on the road, let alone need this thing. But it's male. It's cool. It's bigger. It makes the truck look armored and whatever. Yeah, you can tell uh, when you look at a, a vehicle, like it's got all this snazzy extra stuff on it that it doesn't need, you know, and like a pearlescent paint job. It's like, you're just buying that you you got that to look cool in front of other people and if that's what you need to survive is to feel cool in front of other people i'm not going to dog on you for it but you need to acknowledge is there something wrong with that well yeah, yeah. actually so uh, the another area and again it's it's an, an area sort of dominated by men although not you know entirely to have it so it was in the military uh and i remember you know starting in the very late 80s and early 90s when they adopted the humvee which if anybody's not familiar, uh, Humvee stands for High Mobility Multi-Wheel Vehicle, even though nobody actually spells it correctly, but it's fine. Um, so they, they adopted this vehicle, the Humvee, which the Humvee is actually a really neat and I think interesting vehicle for what it is and for when a vehicle like that is needed. It has an incredibly wide base. Um, it's got a, you know, a nice powerful engine and it'll get you through a lot of mud puddles and mud, you know, all, the, all this type of stuff. Um, but what they <laughs> never sort of addressed is the fact that 90% of the stuff you do in the military uh, for a long time was handled by cut v's so what cut v's were it's just commercial off-the-shelf vehicles they painted you know uh olive drab um and so you'd have you know a jimmy or a a, a suburban or something like that um but there was there is sort of this masculine need for no if we, if we have this bigger vehicle we want that vehicle even though you know the number of times that i drove a humvee on actual muddy hard to drive territory was pretty much only when I was at a driving course for driving in muddy territory. Basically, every other time in the military I drove a Humvee, I was either on 
uh, gravel or 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 just uh, um, concrete. Um, but there is this sort of this need to to take things further and to go. No, we want the bigger thing. Um, yeah. So Humvees. That's a thing. War dog got a ring to it. Um, the other thing that I think is is really important when it comes to consumer habits, and we've talked about this in a whole episode before, but I think it deserves to be brought up again here, is guns. Guys buy guns. Um, now, it is true that uh, women are a fast-growing uh, purchaser of guns, um, but they have a long way to go to catch up. I th the, the research that I did said that men own about 61% of guns in the country, um, and it said that women own about 22%. I assume the rest are just still owned by the companies that built them. It was kind of a weird statistic. Children? Well, only in the South. Um, but uh, so while there is gun ownership, the, you, you can look at the habits of men when they buy guns. Um, so women are less likely to go to shooting ranges or go hunting. Um, both men and women will say that one of their primary reasons for owning a gun is for protection. But for women, that is the primary reason. And for a lot of men, that is a secondary reason. Um, women have a tendency to own guns later in life. Men have a tendency to own guns earlier in life, which is probably why they have so many more of them. Um, women are less likely to consume gun media. So whether you're buying, you know, there's not a lot, guns and ammo doesn't have a huge female subscriber base. Um, and so it just shows how men are sort of obsessed with this, this thing, whereas women do certainly buy guns and they do buy guns in, in larger numbers than they have in the past. Um, and one of the last ones that women are significantly less likely to have a gun loaded and accessible, which men are very likely to do. Um, now, as much as we've seen some increases in crime in the last few years, uh, they're not really significant increases. So and you have so many more people saying they need guns for protection. Well, that to me doesn't track because if they need guns for protection, you would think there would be some threat that rose um, that they're needing the gun in protection of, but that doesn't seem to be the case. I don't know. What do you guys think about the, the, the guns? I know we've already talked about that for a significant amount of time, but- uh, have, you, have you not been paying attention to the invading hordes from South America that have been coming hordes. to destroy the country? I mean- I've got one living in my house. <laughs> I mean, there doesn't seem to be any evidence for it, but they still believe it. They still be have this feeling that the country is going to hell in a hand basket, and a lot of it is foreigners and terrorists and communists and whatever. Well, I'd like to respond to that. And Kel, I'll get to you. Just give me one quick second. Um, I, I don't think it... I, I think whether or not it's true or not is, is elementary to them. They know that they need the guns... And anything that is an excuse to buy the guns is sufficient. There, there doesn't need to be, it's just, they need, they need a tiny little shove to buy five new guns. And that's, that's all the excuse they need. Kale, why don't you go ahead? Sorry. You're fine. I, I only have, I have two comments on this. Um, Cause I, I was thinking about this as well. Um, you only need a gun for protection because other people needs gun from protection or for protection. So if nobody, needed a gun to protect themselves from the other people with guns hence no guns and you don't need that as an excuse to say i, I need to protect myself from that person because they have a gun well what if nobody had guns uh, that, got, that's crazy guys walk around with trees, that's, um and uh, as far as the masculinity uh part of it goes uh and i know this this is off in a different tangent but uh like i was thinking about it's from a movie there's a movie called La the last samurai it's a crazy tom cruise jumping on oprah's couch movie but um uh, in the final scene uh like all these uh feudal samurai are like trying to fight you know to for their way of life to survive to to keep their uh their group you know going and uh so they're going up against their their new modernized government who has enlisted the help of the u.s and they give them gatlin guns and like wh what would you consider more of a traditional masculine role of someone knowing their their outmanned their outgunned going in there with a sword or this guy who's got the new big cool gun that goes and shoots a whole bunch of bullets at your enemies. 
I mean, who do you think is really braver there? Who is the truly more masculine person there? Who, uh, to use the word honor, more honor in it, to, to fight and die for what you actually believe in instead of being like, oh, I'm a big, tough, cool guy because I have this big, fancy gun now. That makes me brave. Well, it's, honor is also toxic masculinity. At some point, somebody wanted to win a war. And so they made the idea of honor to get a bunch of morons to charge Gatling guns with swords. Well, people have personal, okay, uh, instead of uh, your, your, your standards, your morals, your, your beliefs that you stand up for, uh, I think a, a battling over it is, you know, uh, we'll call it old school or whatever, as opposed to uh, a war of words is way better than an actual war. Like, uh, I think a battle uh, debating uh, beliefs would be a lot more constructive than people just killing each other because you don't believe what I believe. Um, I was going to uh, say something about that. So uh, um, I had something to say about that. Go on. My brain doesn't work, unfortunately. Meanwhile, um, <clears throat> no, I think I think there is something to that. The idea of uh, oh, I remember what it was. So uh, shortly after 9-11, uh, Bill Maher, somebody who I don't have much use for, um, but he had said something to the effect that the terrorists were brave, um, and he was, you know, absolutely attacked on from all sides when he said that, um, ignoring for the moment the fact that, that is factually true it does take bravery to do the things they did i think the things they did were horrible and reprehensible and i would have done anything to stop them um but it sort of gets to this idea that no we attribute all the good things to us so bravery is you know for example okay given your suggestion um you know when the british went into certain places in africa and you know shot tribes that didn't have guns and just mowed them down with machine guns and they absolutely went home and thought they were incredibly brave for it um, so that's why I kind of, you know, as we started off and it, it, all this stuff leads back to the idea that this is a constructed identity and it is constructed by people to an end. Um, now, again, the end that corporations are using that identity for today is different than what the British army used it for in the 18th and, uh, 19th and early 20th century. They both um, want power. Well, they want power, but, the, but they're, they're specific. I mean, I'm saying their specific goals, are but their ultimate goal is maintaining power over a group of people. Yeah. Um, so I think that brings up a good point that I feel like we haven't really touched on, which is sometimes uh, I think when toxic masculinity gets mentioned, it's if some people hear men having toxic mas masculinity and that impacting the lives of other people, but are also the men who live in a society under this social construct are also the victims. Uh, they're less than whole people because there are whole sections of emotions or activities that are off limits because, you know, to cry or to go see a therapist uh, would be unmasculine. Um, Jim, that is like the absolute perfect segue into the next thing that I kind of wanted to talk about. Um, could be, yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. Um, and so, for example, men have significantly higher levels of suicide. Uh, men get heart disease at significantly higher levels. Men get higher levels of cancer. Um, now, this is one thing, and, and I want to kind of transition to talking about this just a little bit because I think it's interesting. Um, we have these things, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. They are called men's rights activists. Um, they are frustrating. <laughs> to say the least, um, because they are oftentimes talking about things that really aren't, aren't don't have to do with, with men. Um, and uh, I've talked to my wife many times that I wish there was a real men's rights activist group that went to do thing to, to protect men against the things that are actually hurting them. Um, and this statistic to me is one of the most 
incredible. If you look at uh, people that are killed in the workplace, there are about 387 women killed in the workplace, which, by the way, is terrible. Nobody should kill in the workplace. Um, but if you compare 387 uh, women, 4,377 men are killed in the workplace. Over 10 times the number of men are killed in the workplace as women. Now, why is there not a men's rights activist group that is going to OSHA and going to corporations and saying, hey, why are there 10 times as many people dying at work than there are, as there are women? That's a real uh, uh, men's issue that should be addressed. If only um, they had a union. Well, you know, that's another thing to address, but, but put, a, put that a pin in that for a moment. Uh, so what do you guys think about the, the health aspects? Um, and here, sort of more specifically, physical health, but we'll get into mental health as well. So I'd like to go first on that. Um, one of the things that I've personally been working on the last year is uh, my health. And um, I've been re-listening to a book. Uh, and one of the key health findings of the last 20 years is that one of the things driving a lot of the diseases that uh, cause untimely death, like eight of the top 10, is low level inflammation. And some of that's poor food, but a lot of it is stress. When you are under a tremendous amount of stress uh, over a long period of time, you gear your body up uh, for fight or flight and it has this adverse effect on your body that you end up with low level inflammation and it impacts your health in a whole host of ways. Absolutely. Brandon? Um, yeah, uh, the TV show, uh, Adam Ruins Everything, did an entire episode on this uh, where, you know, it's, it's unmanly to seek help. It's unmanly to go to the doctor to, to even schedule a doctor's, uh, and like an annual checkup is... I, I don't know exactly how, but it's unmasculine to do because you're, you know, you're not Wolverine. You're not just regenerating lost limbs and stuff. You know, like it's, it's emitting weakness and publicly doing so, I guess. I, I don't understand the entire reason behind it, but it's, it's very much a part of the toxic masculinity and it's certainly hurting men because there's a lot of old age preventable deaths. Like I've I've seen some studies saying that lack of sleep can uh, lead to cancer development. I don't know if those are, you know, how solid the science is there. But I mean, you could certainly see people who feel like they have to do uh, uh, what's the the kind of related the the people who are always like, you know, motivational, like uh, saying, "Oh, you gotta." get up and grind hard the grind people are always like if you're not up by 2 a.m you know trying to get on the stock market or something i mean that's all toxic masculinity as well toxic positivity well i think it's false positivity um yeah i uh god my, my train of thought is, is not working today <laughs> apologize um yeah i i think that uh well, oh, I remember I was going to ask. So this is, I think, just to sort of personalize this. So I know I have, and I know Brandon has, and Kale definitely has. Uh, Jim, have you ever lost time uh, from work due to it, uh, an accident at work? Like been out for any time? No. I, I haven't done, I had one time where I, I hurt my head and I was out for a little while. Um, Kale's had, well, <laughs> significant levels of time out due to uh, injuries. Um well, uh, Brent, can you talk about what uh, what your because you were out for a significant, fairly significant period of time due to work related injury? That's what I recall. Oh, right. <laughs> <I> agree. <laughs> you know, the thing uh, what, that bothers has bothered you for your whole life, basically. Well, to be fair, I, I went back on light duty pretty quick. Um, yeah, I, I was working at back in '95. Uh, I was working at a uh, meat packing plant on the kill floor. And uh, I was standing in front of the USDA removing whatever they wanted to remove from pig corpses as they went by. And it was eight and a half hours every day holding a knife like this. And by the end of uh, two months, uh, these four fingers would just lock down. And every morning I'd have to pry them open and 
go back to work. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, and you know, in, in in a way, I I had to see a doctor because I wasn't allowed not to. The company doctor insisted, but especially back in the '90s when I was a young man, I mean, I was only 19 at the time. I'm I'm certain I would have shown those off as like a mark of you know almost like a scar but i, I doubt i would have gone to the doctor had somebody not said something and kill you've had multiple incidents i mean your car accident obviously but oh yeah i've had the one accident uh i've had a few infections at my current job now because i like how you say the one accident like it was well it was the one little accident where i was you know well, and Kale, it's been way more than that. What about the knife? Well, you get tired of talking about it, but no. The yeah. board with the nail huh? in the ear incident. Oh, yeah, the nail in the ear. Well, that was a side job, odd job thing. So it didn't count. <laughs> yeah. Getting the nail stuck in your ear, doesn't everybody do that? No. Um, the thing at the restaurant? You had surgery. Yeah, during- yeah, I cut my tendon. I don't know if Mike remembers that or not. God, I can barely think yeah. about it. Punching my hand on my. I remember yeah, it, very well. It, it stings. Um, you know, you get injured at work. That's what happens. You know. Well, I don't think it's what's happened. I think it's what happens because we don't have a lot of safety stuff. And again, so to bring it back to the idea of the the masculinity, like it's dangerous to be a man, and not because of something that women are doing. Um, I mean, most of the people that are in charge of, you know, most of the places where we were, worked at and got hurt were men also well and mike speaking of which few women would probably get cut by a rusty old license plate and just slap paper towel and duct tape over okay yeah maybe uh that wasn't at work though that was at wrestling and we will talk about that one day it was an extracurricular we we have videotapes um but yeah, just, just this idea that, that it is, and, and it's, it's one of those things that it comes back to because there, there are a lot of issues that face men, um, I think, in this country. And yet, when you look at the men's rights activists, and we'll talk about, I think, those in, in greater detail at another time, um, that those are the issues that those people aren't addressing at all. I mean, you, you don't hear men's rights activists talking about greater uh, work safety standards. You, you don't see men's rights activists, you know, demonstrating in front of OSHA you know, to, to try and get healthier, place, healthier places for men to work. Uh, I mean, if you want the most, you know, awful example, read, uh, uh, um, oh God, uh, what's his name? The book about the stockyards in uh, the Chicago. Jungle. The Jungle. The Jungle, yeah, The Jungle. Um, and that's, that's it. But then, then the toxic masculinity part of that is accepting it, like Brandon was saying, the idea that you sort of accept that as a scar or like, oh, that's just like a, I was so tough. I just put up with it and, and never thinking, wow, why didn't the company do more to help me out? Cause like I was working for them and then they tried to just throw me under the bus the second they could. Well, and, and that's, that's even, a economic issue. Well, it's, it's toxic in to yourself from yourself, but it gets even worse when it becomes somebody else. I mean, God forbid a male coworker of yours gets injured then if you like show sympathy or send them a card or ask how they're doing a lot of the times that gets interpreted interpreted as i don't know weakness or you know because a lot of times people equate being gay with weakness too so if you show an emotion or something like that then you know until they get beat up by a gay guy well, that's sort of related to the second half of the health. You know, we, we were sort of talking physical th- health here, but there's also the mental health. Um, men are half as likely to seek mental health treatment as women are. Um, and I guarantee men experience trauma at significant levels. Um, experience trauma at, I'm sure, equal levels to women. I don't know whether it's better or worse. I don't think it's a, it matters. But men ex- experience significant trauma in their lives, too, and would, would benefit from mental health treatment. Um so one of, the under- one of these things it was talking about that men are more likely to be diagnosed with substance abuse rather than than uh, GAD or depression. And it dealt with this, the history of of uh, psychoanalysis where met where women were just assumed to be, oh, they're women, they're just crazy, whatever. Whereas men, uh, a man would have felt to be felt an almost infringing on his masculinity to be diagnosed with depression 
or generalized anxiety because generalized anxiety that sounds like you're a coward i mean you're not scared are you well um that's why i need a gun way back when i worked uh night crew at uh, uh high v uh, local uh, m- uh midwestern store um is a grocery store I used to work overnights and I got done at seven o'clock in the morning one night and went back home and playing a video game and got a call a couple hours later saying that they were closing the store down because a guy with what they later found out was PTSD had walked into the store, started yelling at people and cutting himself and spraying blood everywhere. And the cops shot him dead. And had we made it turns out he was a veteran had we made mental health not only a priority but not something to be stigmatized especially for soldiers returning from a war which is arguably the worst act humans can witness that could have been prevented it's probably not a hundred percent but it's definitely higher than not doing anything about it yeah, on top um, of that, though, it's not just the, the war thing, though. I mean, other people have Trump. Other people have PTSD. Right. Um, and, but, like, then they're, like, uh, as far as what we were talking about earlier, it's like, oh, that guy was in a war zone. Like, who am I to bitch about the things I've been through? I haven't been through what that... Let's not compare drama or trauma. Uh, you know, everybody's trauma, ha- you know, it, it's important. It doesn't matter if someone experienced it in a different way or you feel like they they had it worse. If you have trauma, you have trauma and you need to acknowledge that. And other people need to acknowledge that. I, I agree. But somebody like a soldier is such an easy catch. Like if you just decided all soldiers returning from a war need to have X amount of sessions with a therapist on the government. It's such an easy catch and such a obvious group to go ahead and start a movement towards better mental health. I mean, uh, well, there's I below, I'm going to put the veterans crisis line below. It's a really, really great resource for veterans. Um, it's three numbers. They answer very, very quickly and they can uh, talk you through things and they can also direct you towards uh, other resources, in-person resources, uh, inpatient resources, things like that as as needed uh jim how do you feel about this um i don't know how i feel about it because i'm a man and i don't understand my feelings uh i don't feel nothing about it <laughs> i i, I, did, I did think of a, a workplace story i was not the person injured but uh there used to be a truss factory uh in town uh to build trusses the structures that go under your roof and uh, I there's actually a trust day. factory right next to the place where Brandon and I worked. Um, and uh, I worked the night shift. Um, my friend and I were the youngest people there. Uh, and they told us to buy your own hammer. And they told us how many ounces to get. It was basically a standard size hammer. Well, one of the, one of the guys that had been there for a long time decided he had to get a gigantic hammer with like the serrated head on it. It looked like it was made for tenderizing meat. Well, it did. One night he, right on his thumb, ripped the thumbnail right off. And uh, he picked it up and continued working. And he came back the next day and it was still taped up. And he got about, you know, an hour or so into work and he couldn't couldn't take it anymore because his his thumb was swelling up and he had you know wrapped it in tape (laughs) it was just you know i didn't go to a doctor and and the thing is whether whether you're talking physical trauma or mental trauma um wounds that are untreated don't just heal or sort of they don't heal right anyway um so oftentimes uh, any kind of injury which is ignored um, will get get worse, and a lot, oftentimes those injuries can become lifelong injuries, uh, as yeah, what Kale can both very much test to. And, and this guy needed 
uh, some help with his injury, partially because he got a gigantic hammer, I presume, because it was a masculine thing. I mean, what we were using hammers for was just tacking down little metal plates. You didn't, you could probably get by with like a children's hammer, you know? Right, right. Um, like a so cool hammer. So one of the other things that, uh, that I saw that in there that I kind of want to talk about, I want to, we'll talk about this a little bit and then probably close out for this week and, and come back next week. Um, next week, meaning like in five minutes. Um, but uh, is uh, masculinity and labor. Um, and again, you, you sort of talk about this idea of a, a, a created um, sense of masculinity, a created identity. Um, and I work 60 hours this week. Exactly. And, and I think all of us have worked jobs where we're really long hours. You know, uh, when I work truck loading, I work long hours. When I work in the army, I work long hours. And that combined with this sort of, there's, there's almost this weird masculine idea of being against labor unions, which is something that is sort of mystifying to me. I don't know, Brandon, you guys uh, worked a lot of those jobs early because you guys were older than I am, much, much older than I am. Um, and uh, so can you talk about your early, you know, entrance into the workforce and uh, how you felt about unions or how unions were sort of described to you or, or, or that type of thing? Well, I, I, would, um, I wouldn't say my early opposition to unions was necessarily masculine. It was more my political leanings. Um, I don't think those two things are unrelated, though. Well, no. Um, but then I had several experiences. At the time, even back when I was a uh, right-wing guy, there was... Uh, some jobs that didn't, at least to me, seem to need a union. And then there was some that were inarguable. IBP, the beef packet, the meat uh, hog rendering plant was definitely one of those where even as a right winger, it's like, yeah, we could use a union. Um, but yeah, a lot of the times I didn't see the need for it. And a lot of it was probably, a, as you say, probably a masculine thing. You know, I I'm tough enough to take anything and like I didn't show any emotions and as all the dead pigs were wheeled by and all, you know, whatever. But yeah, I, it's now to the point where like if you even bring it up, you know, so many corporations are wired for sound, you know, people get in trouble for even mentioning it. I mean, even now you can follow like on the uh, anti-work uh, subreddit that we did an episode on well, like a year or so ago. Um, people uh, getting fired for even talking about a union. And a lot of the times if you have good backing, good financial support, you can get that job back because that's illegal. But it happens to a lot of people who really, I mean, especially, I think the biggest thing, and this is probably a separate issue, but the biggest thing is not having uh, universal health care means you kind of get as trapped as you can. With universal healthcare, you could at least go, okay, I may lose this job, I may lose this income, but at least I'm still protected. At least my family's still protected. And, you know, protecting your family is also a, you know, a tie-in. It's another masculine trait from the old days, but. Yeah, what about you? I don't know why he says it's Italian. What? A tie-in. A tie-in. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was kind of like, hey, I married an Italian. <laughs> She's pretty masculine. Um, anyway, uh, as far as my introduction into the workforce, like I, you know, we're from Iowa. I I rogued and detasseled and worked in uh you know, the fields and stuff for the most part. And then I worked fast food and, you know, some factory jobs and stuff. Um, my dad was in the union. He, he worked at the Firestone in Des Moines for years and years and years from like when he was 17 all the way until when he retired. And then even after he retired, he wasn't really retired. Thanks, America. So he went back to work at, uh, as a janitor for a uh, high school. 
and did that for 10 or 12 more years. And now he's actually retired. Um, and my mom's retired, uh, but, and she didn't have a union either. And she actually had an experience where she went from an hourly job to a salary job and went, and went back to an hourly job because a salary job sucked, but. Um, they often do. Specifically, uh, as far as the masculinity is concerned in that, um, I don't know, like, I'll admit it, I've had trauma in my life. I've had, uh, I've been pretty passive. I never really was concerned about my masculinity. I was just me. Um, so as far as my perspective of it, as far as being a tough guy or whatever, it wasn't me trying to be a tough guy. Like when stuff happened, I just kept going. It was like, what choice do I have but to move on? And uh, I tried it. Now I realize thinking about it, I'm trying to paint it in the color of stoicism or whatever, but um, like, that's not really what I was doing. I was just winging it. Uh, so I guess, and, and as far as you were talking about earlier about the mental health aspect of it and, and Jim brought up, you know, how it affects your relationships with other people um like it does it does change you but you have to change as a person you have to evolve and i don't want to get too carried away from this i don't have much to contribute as far as masculinity versus being in a union or not on this i'm pro union that's that's all i gotta say on that fair enough yeah i i always felt like uh, unions were kind of looked down upon by a lot of guys just like oh you know if 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 I'm going to fight the employer, I'll fight him all on my own, which is like a fucking stupid thing to say, but uh, I could kind of see that. Uh, Jim, what about you? What, what is your experience in that, you know, labor and, and masculinity and stuff like that? Um, so I feel like I had a one specific job that I can think of where um, I, I found it very confusing. Uh, I was a, um, an intern, essentially, at a power company, and uh, I spent a long time at one of the power stations, learning, basically learning how to work, and uh, the guys that were hanging out with um, had union positions, and they didn't really like the union. Like, um, I, from the outside looking in, it seemed like they did not really appreciate the things that the union uh, did for them. Like they were kind of anti-union and I just, I didn't really understand that from my background. Uh, both my uh, parents were teachers when I was younger. Um, definitely took advantage of having union representation during their careers. And uh, later on, my dad uh, actually negotiated uh, collective bargaining agreements for county municipal employees for their uh, their their union, and uh, so you know, in my house, it was super super uh, pro union. I just had one. I, I had one thing. To, uh, well, actually, technically, I had two because you reminded me of one. The first one though is uh, right on base, which is. Um, as far as the union thing goes, since my dad's been retired, he found out in the last year, or it was either last year or within the last year, anyway, um, that the his union, uh, the company that negotiated, uh, that, that he, okay, Firestone or whatever, they, when he retires, he's supposed to get so much um, from his retirement. And, you know, that's the way these union deals work. Well, now they sold that agreement or that deal off. They sold the retirement fund off to this other company. So now he gets retirement money, but they get a fee every month. So not only is he lost all his negotiating power from the union, to make sure things stay right. Now he's also paying extra money to some outside source 
to get his money. So they're not only stealing, I mean, they're, they're literally stealing his retirement fund. They're taking well, your money from you in your face and you can't do anything about it because, ha ha, we made a legal agreement and now you're stuck with it. Well, Kale, I should mention here, um, as big a fan of a union as unions as I am, and I am a union member myself, um, there is some degree, uh, and I'm, we might bring on some maybe union leaders at some point and talk about this more. There is some uh, capture at the top of a lot in union leadership um, where the people in the union leadership end up being closer to the management than they are to their members. Um, which is a very, very serious problem in unions. Um, but the, um, and of course, it all gets back to the capitalism where they just want to take all the money. So yeah. it's like, you're, you want to retire just because you worked here for a bunch of years? What kind of lazy piece of shit would do that? And they want to give these other human beings the benefit of the doubt and just assume they're not purely evil um, because they're trapped in a system that says you need this kind of success or else. But honestly, there's a, there's a line in the Matrix that I and I hate quoting the Matrix. Serious discussion, but it's really important. Um, where when Morpheus is talking to Neo and he says, "All the people that are in the Matrix are still plugged in. Therefore, while they may not be evil, they are an extension of an evil system, um, and so they have to be the enemy. They are the enemy, whether or not you want them to be or not. Whether it's not to say that those people are are evil and you know." sacrifice goats in their spare time or anything like that it just means they are a part of this system and they're bound by it like the people who get convinced they need to know, buy a giant truck i also don't know that you owe any certain group charitability i don't know that you owe fairness like i don't know that you owe fairness to landlords as a group sure maybe some of them have good ideas but are good people or whatever but you don't have to be fair to them. You don't owe them your fairness. We will definitely be doing an episode on landlords at some point. Uh, okay. I think but we're anyways, close out, uh, I think we're going to close out this part before you segue into the next thing. God damn it. I was just about to segue too. I know. I had to stop you cold. I'm sorry. But like you mentioned wrestling and we don't have to get into it. But um, do you think wrestling, pro wrestling as, as we know it, is masculine or feeds into the masculinity thing? No. I think <laughs> I think knowing wrestling, I think wrestling is incredibly complicated. Um, I think that there are there is tremendous, tremendous levels of exploitation in wrestling. Uh, wrestlers work at levels where other people would absolutely be terrified to. Um, I mean, if you look at some of the, you know, the wrestlers have been doing it a long time. I mean, they're working, you know, 340 days out of the year. Um, and and traveling that whole time and it's it's a it's a it's a rough life um and they could certainly use a union which they kind of sort of had one a little bit but not really uh, that being said i'm going to close this section out and we're going to come back for you next week otherwise known as right after i stop recording um and we're going to talk a little bit more about this um Bren, do you have any final thoughts on what we talked about so far uh not so far i think we covered it I, a lot of my thoughts are probably best left to the next episode. Fair enough, Jim. Same here. All right, Kale. Fun editing, Mike. <laughs> I, I do have one final thought. This, uh, I would like All right, Jim, you already said you didn't. Image of you on a Segway. More having a Segway. The four wheel drive one, or I guess it wouldn't be four wheel drive. Two -wheel. Yeah. How could it be? <laughs> And like I said, I know this episode and I, I sort of expected this episode was going to be a little random because we're kind of we're delving into this a little bit kind of for the first time and, and speaking about these things for the first time. And so I kind of wanted us to be able to talk about this in kind of a free form way. Um, but like I said, we are going to come back uh, later on and do more in depth on specific issues. But next week, I think we're going to come back and talk a little bit about some specific personalities in uh, the manosphere and talk a little bit more about toxic, toxic masculinity. Um, that being said, I want to thank everybody for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. Have a good drink and have a good day. Whiskey.